here in Liberia. Yes. Is that right? Art teacher, yes. Mm -hmm. so I get it. I enjoy working with the authentic, authentic Liberian product. Okay. Yes, so I, this is part of what I do. I, in terms of the basket, I've been doing it now for the last three years and using authentic Liberian products. What can I, why is it in the basket? It's a variety. You have Liberian Christmas cards, greeting cards, uh, coconut candy, chocolates, homemade chocolate, honey, mm. local honey. Uh, we have our patriotic calendar. Right. Our patriotic Liberian calendar. Right. And a patriotic notepad, Baringa is also a uh, form of medicine. And we, these are all the portions of the basket. And then the ginger beer. Oh, that's a lot of things. Which is my specialty. Which one? The ginger beer. Ginger beer. Okay, what's your name? Eh? Margin. Margin. Uh -huh. You're from Liberia. Liberia. How long have you been here? Oh, well, I've moved, I moved home in the last six years. Where were you before? in the U.S. and in some other parts of Africa. So, why did you come back? Why? Well, because it's home for one. I wanted to be home. The conflict kept us away, kept me away specifically. And once, as I, I was close, listening for things to simmer a little bit to come and view the landscape. So, things get better now? Things pretty better? In my opinion, we have a long way to go, but we're taking baby steps, as I was telling the gentleman here. Baby steps are taking the right direction, particularly in terms of being enterprising, which I think Liberians really, really need to. Electricity and water will be the two. And then you cannot put all the road network because to me, those three have to work in harmony. Our road network, of course, farm to market, for people to become more and more enterprising. And then, of course, the electricity, it goes with water. So for me, those are the, some of the three major areas. If the, if the government, the leadership, put more priority to that. And then my, my, um, my career is education. So I think that is nearest to my heart. That's why probably I didn't bring it up first. Mm. But that is definitely all of those and education should top that list in terms of the value that we need to represent. To so them. what's missing? Teachers, you know, structure infrastructures, uh, what? What's the problem in education? All of the above, but more importantly, we need teachers who value the profession. Because I believe once you truly value the profession, the career of teaching, you will do whatever it takes to, to give it the value that it needs. You will, put the ex, you will go the extra mile. And we need people who are truly committed to the profession because then there won't be any room for compromising. And I think it's because of all the different rooms that are open, people tend to compromise value of education and I think that is our biggest and bravest challenge in Liberia. I don't see education as being on that top priority. Tell me something. You have problem. There's problem worsening, improve. Which one? Which part? Is it improving? You know? You sound like some solution. I would you can... say it's improving, but way too slow. Okay. Way too slow. So uh, it's improving very gradually mm. since I've come home. But one of the things I'm seeing, I'm seeing a proliferation of schools. We have so many schools. It's a good thing to have schools, but then again, you need schools that will deliver on quality. And this is where the gap seems to be widening again. Moving in one direction, but then, so I think that is where the challenge is for the leadership to try to find a balance, creating the value that we need and we deserve.
deserve so that we can move to the next next level sure. where we need to be in terms of because I think the Liberian children I've, I've been moving around the country in terms of like I said education is my real career path and calling so I've, I've uh, had an opportunity to see the good the bad and the ugly as you say and I see the the gap seems to be widening in terms of the the value quality so I think that it's up to the government now to start weeding out those who truly value the, the career, the profession, and those who are just in it for, for the wrong reason. Now, if you were up there, if tomorrow they call you up there to do something, what will you do? To, like the government, what you expect them to do, or what you advise them to do, because that's sometimes they don't know what you know as to be in the classroom. Right. In so, terms of education. Yes, in terms of improving the education to the point where you would think, yes, I'm satisfied. And your suggestion. I think the edu the the government, if that were to be a reality. One of the things I would say is to get a, a vigilant, a vigilante tax task force, a vigilante and truly vigilante task force to go out there on a daily basis and start weeding out. Like you said, you separate the wheat from the chaff and do the separation because and, and it, it, it's going to be painstaking, it's going to be hard. But I think we need to start somewhere. Do they, the teachers, if you want to weigh them out, why they get there in the first place? Does that government hire teachers or yeah, hire works? I, I think my observation is not that they, they got in there because they, they look at education as a money-making mechanism. Like a job. Like a, they don't look at it as a passion. Yes. As a career, this is my calling. They look at it as more monetary. I can open a local mom and pop school yes. and just give charge of 10, 20 LDs. And, and it's okay because there's no, no oversight. Right. So if there were oversight in place, and they would, like my judge just said, weed out. These schools have a vigilante task force that will go around like an SRO officer will go around and make sure these children are off the street and not in uniform all day walking up and down the street. We need that. We need some structure. It's not regulation in the establishing schools or hiring teachers. Is that what it is? Uh, I don't know if it's the government's fault. It, I, I don't know. I can't just put it on the government. But I think it's because it, if it's under the Ministry of Education, then maybe I'm sure, maybe the minister has some place, things in place. But she needs help her as well. Yes. You know, she can't do it all by herself. Yes. She needs it's help. It's a lot of work. So it's a lot of work. And if she needs help, and the people who she puts in place, they have to be accountable to her and help her get these things accomplished. So I'm sure if she, if she had that in, in place, she would be able to do something and we'll see better, you see a better understanding, get a better understanding of what is going on and can go on to the next level. Uh, and, the, and the process, do you think that the people that are being elevated to manage the schools are where they should be? Because sometimes, mostly in the African country, you put your sister, right. even if it's had nothing to do with this education. Exactly. They, they put friends. They put. Do you think that in this case is that the case, or you can see it that? It could yeah. be. It could be. It's in. in it, it, it could be that in some places people have their relatives and their friends. That, like I said, they use it as a money-making yes. institution when it's not. I mean, people don't value any education anymore, and this is this, this is wrong because. When there's, when there's no solid education in, your, your, your fabric of society is over. The fabric is shattered. So if we, we know we want to teach the kids, but this is for our children. 
how do we see our children in the next five years? In the next 10 years, they should be competent enough to compete with any country in the world. It is so important, and this is why also they've started this early child childhood education, and this is how to promote that 100%. Because the early childhood speaks to age appropriation. And we now we see some kids over age for the classes. These are, there's a lot of things that we need to work on. All right, so what's your name, ma'am? <laughs> My name is Agari Herring. Thank you very much. Um, so, like so I would like to thank you for for the interview, you know. And uh, you're welcome. Do you have anything that you want to add to this time we spent talking? Well, I think I'll just like to say we, we wish we would have these ongoing forums, talks, exhibits, displays, so that we get to know who, who we are. Because so often, like I remember years ago, they had a Liberian directory. And people could go open your directory and you get to know, oh, this person is doing this, that person is doing that. Now, it's only by word of mouth. And we need more of these networking exchanges so that we get to identify who's out there doing what. And I think it helps to strengthen us as, as Liberians in terms of what we're doing in our various industries. Okay. Tell us about you again. Who are, who are you? Okay, I'm Marge Ann Baker, and I'm the principal of Spirited Academy, Stella Maris Compound, Stella Maris Polytechnic. It's right here across from the Foreign Affairs, next hey, to LU. Monrovia, It's right Liberia. here. This Monrovia, Liberia. Yes. And I'm and the prin principal. principal at Spirited Academy. I'm also a teacher, educator, and this is a hobby of mine, so this is why I'm here. I'm well, indulging in my habit right my hobbies right now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. And